So good morning, Jason. Hi. Um, and thanks, thanks for taking the time to chat to all the Miss Lolly listeners um, about your new book, Money Moments. Found it really interesting, especially with for the financial well-being tips that you've got in there. And I just wanted to really pick your brains on the inspiration for the book and and how you how you got there. Well, I mean, how, how I ended up writing it was that um, I retired as a financial advisor two years ago um, when I was about 46. And um, I started to, I always had an interest in the overall concept of financial well-being. So not necessarily the concepts of being rich or, or having stuff or necessarily working out pension contributions or anything dry like that. I was more interested about the impact that money had on people's lives. Either they didn't have enough or they had too much or it didn't, they didn't do the right things with it or it was a cause of tension and frustration in their life. And um, after I sold my business and ceased being an active financial advisor, I started to do financial well-being courses for groups of employees. And these were more like a performance and, uh, and through story and role play and anecdotes, I started teaching people what all the academics have shown us are the key components to having good financial well-being. And, and financial well-being being that you don't have worry, stress and anxiety about money and you have choices and that you do things that help you have a fulfilling life. So it's not about being rich or so, as such, it's about mm -hmm. having choices and doing things which are in tune with your life. And lots of this is about habits, behaviours, um, and impulses and, and, and what, what's important to us. So that was the motivation and I decided that I needed to write the book because it really set down in, in a sort of a one, one document, if you will, pretty much what I was teaching everyone all around the country. So I thought well, if I write a book, it's the kind of book that, um, and I always write this with my children in mind, is the book that I would give my adult children. And my oldest daughter is now 19 and she's at university and it was the kind of book I thought, well, I think she would engage with this um, but equally, if you're in your 50s or 40s or 50s and you've got stuck or you've got money as a cause of uh, tension in your life, my view is that it would be equally useful for you to get back on track or uh, avoid having problems with money. So it's not, a, it's not like most financial uh, planning or um, personal finance books. It's designed to help you get to the root cause um, of either the, the, what's holding you back with money or help you get more happiness and fulfillment. What I really liked about it is you obviously clearly identified from a young age what was holding you back and that was your um, lack of education mathematically um, and lack of confidence with maths. Do you think that people put their money and maths in the same bucket and therefore think that if they can't do one they can't do the other? I think a lot of people, not all people because we're all different, but a lot of people essentially have that little voice in the back of their head that says, I was no good with maths at school, I'm no good with numbers, I don't really understand logic, it's too difficult, it was boring, and therefore they immediately say to themselves, even if they're not saying to themselves overtly, subliminally, they're already failing before they start. So for instance, we know that financial capability, the ability for people to do functional maths, just understand percentages, you know, when you go in a shop, buy one, get one free, um, percentages, reduction. People are overwhelmed with choice in stores and their basic lack of mathematical confidence, I would call it, um, means that they often make suboptimal choices and they can also be uh, manipulated and they can be vulnerable to other organisations or other individuals who might not have their best interests at heart. And it means that they either make no decision or they make bad decisions. If you then add that lack of a uh, what I call financial wherewithal, um, mathematical wherewithal, they equate that to being, I'm no good with money. They may not think that, but that's what it does. It, it often manifests itself. But for some people, it, they are good mathematically with money. You know, they are good mathematically, can understand percentages and fractions and stuff like that and, and understand logic, but that they've got bad impulses or they're equating having money with having self-worth or... Um, or if they aren't driving a nice car, that somehow they're not a winner or they're not worthy of someone's love or affection. And we see this all around, and, and these are the themes of the book. It's the sources of pain with money and the sources of joy. And as I said, you know, in the book, we've, we've got things like how, you know, if you compare yourself to others, if you're using um, uh, materialism as a proxy for a value in your life, but unless you get to the root cause of what causes you to do something or not do it, you won't make any change. So when I was self-reflecting whilst reading your book, I was thinking, what's my money weakness? What, what could be my money down for? And 
it doesn't take much thinking <laughs> because it's definitely clothes. Um, I fall in love with shoes. I fall in love with handbags and coats and none of them went cheap. So I got round that by having a budget that I call my splurge budget. And that's my fun budget. That's my money that I can spend on clothes guilt free. And once that's gone, that it, it's done. So your book is not about um, being a financial miser. It's about finding out what works for you, presumably. Yes, and I think that's the point. And that's the, uh, if there's one thing I want people to take away from the book, this is not about living like a miser and a Scrooge and a kind of a monk today for some great day when you're falling apart and in an old people's home. That's not what it's about. It's about really being intentional about well, the role that money plays in your life and you being an active participant, not, not over-engineering over it, but as you say, so you love shoes, okay? They give you, they give you happiness, they give you a sense of um, a warm feeling, but that feeling as we know, and we know from the academic studies, wears off, doesn't it? But as you'll see from the book, that's okay as long as it's not um, being destructive about the rest of, of your life. So in other words, you've got a budget, and again, it's guilt free because, you know, a lot of us do things and, you know, do we, especially when you're in a relationship, I know you're married, you've got two kids, you've got other obligations. We shouldn't have guilt and we shouldn't have. And that's why we, my wife and I have always had the blow it fund, we call it, you know, the, the fund money. We're all human. None of us are perfect. None of us have got all this perfectly mapped out. But awareness, as you said, I like shoes. I've got to keep on buying shoes. But here's the other thing, Lisa, as you know from the book, what's the other chapter we talk about? Decluttering. Decluttering yeah. is about reacquainting yourself with those shoes that you'd forgotten about at the back of the wardrobe that actually are really good that go with your new outfit, but also giving stuff away and creating some mental space so that perhaps you don't always need to go shopping and selling stuff on eBay yeah. and getting money back. So it's about being in control and, and that's really what it's about. Another story in your book that really resonated with me is something that I see day to day um, as a financial advisor looking after the wealthy. Um, was a story about Gary and Lisa, who are a very wealthy couple. Um, they've got lots of money. They've got all the flash that goes with that, the posh cars and, and all the bling. But one day their car just doesn't work and they don't get any money on the way to their posh ball. And I, the most extreme situation that I've ever had was where I had a banker came to see me in May, just having received his million pound bonus in his bank. And he was still £30,000 overdrawn. And to me, that was mind boggling. Um, and he was taken aback. And I think the reason he became a client of mine was because we stripped it back to the beginning. Why was he really £30,000 overdrawn um, five minutes after he'd received a bonus that most people will earn in their whole lifetime? It feels like what you're talking about in your book um, is that everybody needs to do that, whether they're earning... £10,000 a year or £10 million a year, you can still have these bad habits. Yes, and learn behaviour. Okay, so belief is the first thing. All behaviours and habits come from a belief system. The simplest way to think about it is everyone has a money story. Now, I'm not a psychologist, so I can't possibly uh, talk with any authority about the, the psychological aspects, only in so far as what I've read and what I've observed in the thousand people I've interviewed in 25 years. So I've met a lot of people. And, and as I said to people, we all have a money story. Now, that money story is either enabling and helping you and helping you do the right things, or it's holding you back or it's programmed you to do things that are destructive. So, for instance, the banker, it may be that he, he there were some issues when he was growing up where money was equated with love or spending. He didn't get attention from his parents, perhaps. And the only time he did get attention was when they were giving him things or spending money. And therefore, you get a deep seated, you get a deep seated, um, um, weak relationship between the role of money and, the, and your self-esteem and your self-worth. You can't get too heavy with people, but I think if we're all aware that we've all, we all come at money with different beliefs, and it's those beliefs that drive our behaviours. Now, a self-belief can be a positive thing, um, which means, you know, you could say, I'm going to be good with money. I am good with money. My, my oldest daughter, Daisy, says, Dad, I'm great with money. Right? And she says it all the time, and she really is. I mean, she, she said, I've been underspending in my student budget, and, um, and plus I've got £100 I came to uni with my own money, so I'll buy my reckoning, I should have £200 by the time I come home. 
That's what she's focused on. And she really is, and she believes that, and she says it all the time. Equally, if you say, I'm no good with money, it just goes through my fingers, or you're not saying it to yourself, but there's a subliminal sadness where you think that buying things, or buying people's attention, or running with a rich crowd, do you, you with me, keeping up with the Joneses, bottles of champagne, or whatever it is, there's nothing wrong with having a splurge, but if that becomes ingrained habit, and you get into a habit of, does it really make you happy? Is this really part of your value system? Is this really what it's all about? Because long after the money's gone, it's what does it, how does it make you feel? And we know that certain spending has very limited, I mean, look, shopping, as we know, is great fun, but it doesn't last. Giving money to charity um, does give most people a sense of fulfillment, as long as it's a planned giving to a charity that you thought about and you don't tell anyone, because that's about examining your internal thoughts. It's about loving yourself within and making sure that you're not, your behaviours are in line with your values. And the problem that you find, and certainly, I don't know if you experienced this in your career, Lisa, but I've certainly found it with all the clients I've met, is that very few people do examine what a good life is and the role that money plays in it. One of the reasons that I sold my business was because um, I had a client who dropped dead of a heart attack at 46 and he was worth 28 million pounds. Um, and I use a story all the time when I speak in my keynotes uh, about how that made me feel. But it made me re-examine my own life. And I thought, I'm never going to get another chance to do this. And I don't want to make 100 rich families richer. I want to make a massive difference to lots of people, which is one of the motivations of doing the well-being. Not for me to tell people what a good life is, or for me to say how they should be thinking about money, but be intentional and think through what is good and what role does money play? How does it fit into my life? And then are my daily actions in line with that? And then, of course, there are other things like, you know, trying to stretch your thinking beyond just next year or, or the next holiday or whatever and thinking, am I doing things today that my future self is going to appreciate? I find that the hardest part of my job um, on a day to day basis is actually getting clients to think about what they want. Um, so they know how much they want to earn, let's say, but they don't know what that what that means to their real life. So when I start asking them questions about when do you want to retire, what kind of lifestyle will you have, what things are important to you, what kind of holidays will you go on, and sort of building up this picture of the future, it's often a, a question that people really struggle to answer. Um, sort of the long-term direction, which I think is often, well, it's definitely the place that I start um, with financial planning for clients. I did it slightly differently. I mean, obviously, I evolved my discovery process. For most people, money is a source of pain. I really believe that, even if they're not sure about it. Um, and for other people, it's it's a measurement of how well they think they've done in life. Okay, the prop, That's fine, as long as it doesn't become over overbearing. What I used to start with is I would say to people, tell me what your story, tell me your story. So if they were an entrepreneur or a bank or whatever it is, and I'd want to go back without being too too quickly too deep, I would say, so what was it like growing up at home then? You know, what, what were the conversations about money growing up at home? Now, when someone starts telling you what it was like growing up at home around the dinner table, like either there was lots of money or it was very, very, in my case, growing up, there was very little money. It was either a source of joy and choices or it was a source of pain and anxiety. Either they did talk about money or they didn't talk about money. And when you know someone's money story, it tells you an awful lot about their motivations it tells you an awful lot about their values, and it also helps them understand how they got where they are, whether that's good or bad. And one thing about hearing a money story is it's not about being judgmental. So what I was always interested in was, look, where are these people coming from? Because obviously, like you, I mean, I interviewed nearly a thousand people in 25 years. There's a hell of a lot of people, and not one of them had the same story. They might have fallen into different kind of zones, if I can use that term. There might have been seven or eight different typical kind of clients, but they were all slightly different. And they all have different motivations and different fears and different aspirations. So I found that finding out someone's money story and the, the magic was when they told me their money story and where money fitted in, they didn't even, it almost sort of tipped out of them as I left them the time and the space to speak about it. And then when I relayed it back to them, what they'd already told me, they were invariably blown away because one that they'd never heard those words liberated before about how money fitted into their childhood and their early uh, years. But when I'd said it back to them, not only was it a revelation that they'd heard their own words, but that someone else had bothered to even listen. And this is about you being on the front foot. This is about you being the master. This is not money's good or bad. It's just you being 
intentional, you being on the front foot and you calling the shots. It's about you being the conductor, not playing every instrument. When I was reading your book, um, I didn't expect to actually laugh out loud. Can you guess oh, really? which bit made me laugh? Um, it was your mum's Christmas, Father oh, Christmas, <laughs> that she bought in June. Um, yeah. And it's not a statue. <laughs> um, oh, what, yeah. what was your favourite part of the book? My favourite part of the book? Um, oh, it's difficult because, you know, you, you, you nurture something. It's a bit like children. You nurture it for so long. You, 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 you sort of almost, when it's done, you almost never want to see it ever again. Um, I think I have to admit that the, the favourite part for me, or, the, the, or certainly the chapter that resonates with me, and is something particularly for younger people I want them to take away, is the moment I decided walking back from the, the kid from my school who lived in the really big house that was the size of my street. Um, yeah. I remember walking back. It wasn't about wanting to be rich. It was my decision, assuming, you know, obviously I didn't have mental or physical disabilities that stopped me from doing it, but my decision not to be poor. I thought to myself, my mum and dad work hard but we don't have a garden, we don't have any money, we don't have any choice, we don't have a table to eat our food at. I thought, I'm decided now, this guy and his parents are certainly no more able than me. I'm not going to be a victim. I'm not going to let society tell me what it's going to have in store for me. I'm going to be in control of my destiny. You know, and that was, at, that was at 10 or 11 years of age. I remember walking home, making that decision. I can still remember it now, and it still hits me emotionally. I decided not to be a victim and I was not going to be poor. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I made the decision. And that's the one thing I want people to realize. It's not, if, not being poor is not the same as being rich. It's about, it's about yeah. having dignity. It's about having self-worth and it's about having, knowing the role of money in your life. And, and, and I don't, you know, I'm still growing as a person. I'm still learning. I'm still open to, I read a book a week on happiness and fulfillment and, and the human condition and spirituality. So I'm interested in all these things. Um, but it starts with making the decision that you aren't going to be a victim, that you're going to be on the front foot. If someone's inspired by listening to this to actually start to make changes, how quickly do you think people can change? Is it going to be sort of your New Year yo-yo diet? Well, um, my mum was always on a constant diet of some description at some stage in her life. And I always said to my mum, I can remember now saying, mum, it's not about diets, it's about changing your lifestyle. But you, before you can change anything, you've got to be clear where you are now and why that's not working for you. And you've got to have a compelling picture. The way to look at it is I think people can make changes, but they have to be realistic. There's, there's a limit to what you can do in three to six to 12 months, but there's no limit to what you can do over 25, 30 years. Um, but here's the point. All the small things you do today, so this morning, I haven't eat, I don't eat, I, I fast for half the day twice a week. And, and I've been to the gym this morning and I've done other things. Now, I didn't have to do those. Oh, I can just not bother today. But you see, part of staying fit and healthy and, and being comfortable with myself is about having my physical um, self, having energy, um, looking after myself, um, keeping myself in good nick. So it's the same with money. Is it's it's small. Lots of small things each day add up to a good outcome overall, and it make you feel good. I think the way to look at it is people have to have a compelling vision of what good looks like in terms of how will you feel if you have an emergency fund? How will you feel if you don't have debt? How will you feel if you have um, if you have d income coming from different sources? How will you feel if you, work is optional? You work because you want to, not because you have to. How would you feel if you could save, um, you know, uh, have a pay rise and just know it's going to, it means that you could actually be financially independent at 50 and not 60? How would you feel if you could actually redirect your current spending and double the amount of happiness and fulfillment you get without spending any more money, but just by redirecting it to different types of spending that are more relevant to who you are? So it might be you cancel the gym subscription and you join a running club and the money that you save, you use to pay off that, that big credit card bill that's blown up over the last five, six years. But it's about taking control and it's about feeling, feeling that you're doing stuff which is in tune with who you are. And I think it's small steps, but the first stage is to get inspired. And that's why I wrote the book with stories. There's a framework there, the four key, the four key elements of financial well-being, six or seven stories in each of the frameworks so that you can actually, through the stories, You'll learn the habits, you'll learn the thing. But it starts right in the beginning with, with, you know, what's holding you back and what does good look like? I think it's also important to point out that it's not just 
um, people who don't have much money that have bad spending habits. I see a lot is where people have a huge amount of money, but it makes them scared. They think they haven't got enough. They don't dare spend it. They don't dare have fun and enjoy it. Um, and part of my role as their advisor is often highlighting to them what they do have disposable, what they can spend um, guilt-free. Do you find that a lot as well? Well, all my clients were wealthy. And, um, you know, obviously I did pro bono work once a year where I dealt with people who were in a financial pickle, etc. But yes, there is this problem. I mean, one of the things about people who strive and people who get financial success, uh, I know this from a personal experience and I know this from meeting clients, is that some of them have, um, they're, they're carrying a lot of guilt because they believe that no amount of money will ever make them feel rich. And I know that because I mean, obviously, perhaps if I was Warren Buffett, I might feel it, but, but I've never got to a stage where I have so much money that I feel rich. I feel rich as a person, and I've realized that, that I can't judge my happiness and fulfillment by the numbers of wealth that I've built. Okay? I love making money, and I like having money. So I think a lot of wealthy people, are high, high achievers, high earners, they carry guilt. Um, they're not clear the role that money plays in their life. And what happens is they get into the habit of making money, but they don't get into the habit of directing money in a way that, that would make them happy. In other words, just accumulating more and more is the habit that they've developed, but it's not a healthy habit because it, they're not feeling but secure. What about, people, what about people who have inherited it? I think that can sometimes come with even more guilt that you well, um, have been given this money and sort of a custodian of that wealth. Well, well, well and it, it also depends on the relationship you have with the, with the person who gave the money or is giving the money or is going to give the money. And often parents use wealth as a means of power and control and coercion. Um, and that's, that's been since the beginning of time. You know, if, if you don't come and see me when I'm old and decrepit, I won't leave you any money. Or, you know, if, if you're not nice to me, I'm not going to help you out. The chapter in the book called Legacies That Last is actually a very, very good chapter. It can deal with most families, but one of the key things, there's a checklist in there of the 10 points that you should think of, but one of the most important thing is, is to talk about money in the family. Um, you know, and I tell the story in one of my FT articles about my daughter asked me how much I was worth. We were sitting having breakfast one day, just like, Dad, how much have you worth? Um, it was such a left beam question, and it was so loaded that I thought, well, if I answer the question, and she tells everyone at school, uh, some people are going to, think you know he's bragging other people are going to think god he's a loser other people are going to think well so what so it was such a loaded question and then also does she think i'm 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 mr smarty pants and a, a big winner or does she think i should have been more successful and so i think i think the issue about people gifting money or children and, and young adults and young people are going to receive or have received money is there is a lot of issue with guilt there's a lot of issue about motivation about your role in life especially if you receive large amounts of money and one of the things is once you found your way in life and you found your when economic motivation is not the key thing, you have to find another way of getting fulfilled and, and, and you have to learn the way to be motivated in the absence of an economic need. So in other words, finding your self-worth in the life is more important than working out your net worth when you come from a wealthy family, because then you'll do the right things. And, and, and history is um, full of families that went from, you know, being producers of wealth and then in two or three generations to consumers of wealth. So I think the most important thing when you're thinking about transitioning wealth is to teach young people how to be producers of wealth and to do positive things with it and not to drink it up, drink it or put it all up their nose or whatever it is or do destructive things with it. It's that con uh, producing wealth mentality and abundance and doing the right thing and having values, which is, I think, the most the key to making sure that legacies do last, because money is merely the, the petrol. Um, your life fulfillment and motivation is the engine. So how did you answer that question with your daughter then? Was it with a figure or was it with, um, did you turn it back on her? I said to her, look, darling, that's, that's an interesting question. Look, I think, I think it's not the time to be going into pounds, shillings and pence. Obviously, we live in a beautiful house. We've lived in it for 20 years and we don't have a mortgage, OK? Um, and we both, you know, we bought a, a brand new car, a um, couple of years ago that we then wanted her to learn to driving and I pay for the insurance for her, which is not cheap. So she knows there is, she knows we're, you know, we're not scratching as it were for money, but we're not flash people. So we lived in the same house. We've had the same television for 12 years. I've been spending the last year and a half deciding which smart TV to buy and how to buy it and when to buy it. So she knows that, she knows that we're, we're, we're comfortable, um, but she knows that we, we fight a fiver to the floor. Um, yeah. So uh, we didn't answer it with a number, 
but then when we talked about um, when I sold the business, we started talking about numbers and talking about the sale consideration and money's coming in. And, and what actually happened to her, she said, well, where's all the money come from, Dad? Because she couldn't understand. Because she said, well, you don't have a proper job. I said, well, I do have a proper job. I'm a writer and a speaker. It's different from what I did before. <laughs> it always gets people laughing at conferences. Um, because her idea of a proper job is you go to the same place every day, like I did for 20, 23 yeah. years. And um, I said, well, no, I never. that was never me. Me was always being, being flexible. It was about fitting work in to my meditation and to my yoga and to my fitness and to my reading. Because I read two books a week. I mean, it takes a lot of time. So I, that's what I do, but she doesn't see it like that because obviously, and, and as I've explained to her, you know, we built passive income, we built assets, we've got money working for us now, so we don't have to work as hard as other people for money. But I'm still more than ever motivated to do what I call my normal work. It, it may not produce me the same level of income that I had when I was a, a, a partner in a firm uh, advising wealthy people, but. Do you know what? I'm happier than I've ever been. Now, I'm not knocking people who earn six, seven, eight hundred thousand million pound a year doing whatever they do, but that was never enough for me. And as I say, I hope when I take my last breath, people remember me. Um, but there's plenty of people out there earning lots of money. No one's ever going to know who they are. And for ma what matters to me is that the legacy is that I leave the place better than I found it, and I help a lot of people find some peace and, and fulfilment and, and get the role of money in their life uh, in context. You've got a sort of 20 point checklist um, that you've got with the book. How yeah. would Miss Lolly readers get their hands on that? Well, uh, as I say, the book is £10, so it's not uh, out of the budget. And I think it's probably one of the best Christmas presents anyone could have or a birthday present or a New Year present or a new tax year present. But if you can't or don't want to buy the, the, the full book and get engaged with the stories, then the checklist, which is in the last chapter, is available as a free download from my website, which is jasonmiddle-butler.com. And uh, obviously, you've got to leave your email and your name, but you can opt out of any mailings. But you can download the free PDF, which shows you all 20 points. And it's not rocket science, any of it, is it? I mean, the first thing, the first no. thing is about is about thinking right about money. Um, and then there are, it gets more granular. But everyone can get their hands on that for free, um, and they just go to my website uh, and download it. Okay. And then one last question, then be before we end, I was always interested when reading your book to know did the story were the stories inspired from the research that you read, so you fit your stories in around the research, or did the stories come first and then you went and did your research from there? Well, obviously, I'm always absorbing. I'm like a, I'm like a, you know, like a, those those leaf machines or the street cleaning machines. Um, mm -hmm. That's how I am with research. So, um, and some of it, because I've written four other books, so I'm always researching, I'm always reading. So some of the research um, was the basis of the chapter, and then I dug deep and thought or researched or remembered stories. But other stories just came out of me that were just natural stories. And then I looked for the research to see if there was research, because I wouldn't put them in the book if there wasn't research to support the theory. So in other words, I did re write a number of real life stories, uh, both my own and real clients, um, which I thought might be interesting and anecdotally. And I would not have put them in the book unless I could have found some research to support them. So it was a mixture of some it was the stories, then I found the research. Others, it was the research, then I, I found the right story. But but that's the most important thing you need not just you don't just need logic and uh, academic substantiation of ideas you need that but you also need and this is really important and this is what the book's about you need that emotional connection and understanding and um, an acceptance of that this is real so that the theory is one thing but how does this work in real life and that's really why the stories I think are so in is, is insightful for helping people connect with the ideas. And I think it helps you remember them as well. I won't yeah. forget Lisa and Gary. No, you or won't. So there we go. Place. Yeah, there. Oh, yes. So there we go. So now you're remembering. So that's the beauty. And that's why the book is if you buy the checklist, it's a bit like um, it's a bit like um, how can I put it? It's a bit like it's a bit like a to do list, really. Um, the to do list is one thing. It tells you what you should be doing, and when you should be doing it. But the rest of the book tells you the why. And uh, as opposed to the how and the why often for many of us, as I say, just in closing, the why often is the issue for us. If we can get to our inner mot motivations, if we can get resonance and if we can get engaged with this and see this as a positive, then the checklist will just be, you know, your to do list um, in a structure. Well, I loved your book, um, Jason, and it really definitely got me thinking about my financial. Well, 
psychology, I suppose. It's not something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. So thank you very much and thank you for your time. That's a pleasure. And thanks very much indeed for taking the time. As I say, um, I'm very, very, very happy to um, uh, answer readers' questions and so on if they go to my website. Uh, and I'd love to hear if people buy the book, what their favourite chapters are, and more importantly, what their stories are. So thanks very much for having me on. Thank you. Bye.